Welcome and thank you for participating in this virtual presentation for the Eastern Region of IPPS. In these times, it is so important that we all stay focused and work through our new regimen of life. IPPS is such an important organization for all of us who in some shape or form are career horticulturists. This new format is working very well and we all look forward to more presentations online. So please step up and let's see what you can seek and share. I started Foxboro in 1978 and over the years it has grown exponentially. It all started with a woody plant professor at the University of Maryland who introduced the world of unusual and dwarf plants. I had the greatest opportunity in 1975 to buy all the remaining conifer collection from Kingsville Nursery. These plants were all in small clay thimble pots and tomato cans in Henry Holman's greenhouse. I cleaned out the greenhouse and this is when it all started. Over the years, I built a relationship with other collectors, such as Pete Vermeulen, John Vercade, Jim Cross, and many others. I also developed correspondence with nurseries from around the world. At one time, my collection of conifers, rare, unusual, or hard to find, 3,000 different varieties. It wasn't until 2003 when my oldest son, Brad, just out of college, came into the business and started major changes. I remember the day he said to me, Dad, this is no longer a hobby nursery for growing and collecting unusual conifers. It is time to make a future of a production nursery, starting with a simple 14 by 75 foot Quonset hut greenhouse on minimal acres to today having over 500 acres and a major production of conifers and deciduous trees and shrubs. We do all our cuttings and grafting in-house. When needed, we will supplement from outside sources for those selections that are hard to propagate or financially feasible to just buy from another liner source. We base our cutting and grafting timing on availability of labor. Since we are in the H-2A program, our employees are not here in December or January. Years ago, we were able to change our entire method of propagation to work around their time here. Our greenhouses are simple greenhouses uh, built from uh, treated lumber structures, as you can see here in these photographs. Uh, very simple, but it works in our production schedule. Uh, since we're only growing material for our own use, we do not need such a large range. All conifer cuttings are completed hardwood cuttings, beginning weather permitting in late November after several, several frosts. And here you can see us taking cuttings from green giants. Cuttings are taken from our production plants in the field. We strive to take cuttings through young plants, but sometimes as these green giants, since we're doing so many, we'll use the larger plants uh, that are in our stock rows. Uh, these young plants have been in our field no more than two to four years. We have found in the past that the old stock plant will lower the rooting percentage in second cuttings. All cuttings are taken in the morning, a.m., after sun, uh, before the sun or heat builds up, and, and it has to do too as long as it's above freezing. We stick all that we take that day. In this picture, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, all of our soil media is pre-mixed in another building, and we shrink wrap that to protect from any type of bacteria or debris getting onto the flats. And then it comes down to the head house area, uh, and they work right off of these palletized flats. All cuttings are prepared for sticking in a uniform length and quality. All are treated with some form of rooting hormone. It will vary depending genus type or even species. And sometimes we'll experiment from time to time on new chemicals to help promote rooting. All cuttings are in a mixture of peat and perlite. And that ratio of peat and perlite can vary depending on the, the genus or species we're using. 
and then they're placed after we stick the cuttings are placed on a bench with a bottom heat in our propagation houses and you can see here how we have that set up and the variable colors and, and different types of conifers that we've stuck uh, these cuttings will stay in these flats uh, and in this prop house until mid-spring when they are lifted and potted into four inch pots and moved out to the growing area. Like anybody else that roots conifers, we do run into uh, periods, years where we'll have plants that will root very well and then we'll have years of plants that won't root well. Uh, our common uh, problem is usually if we're running into a drought situation in the summer previous to us taking our hardwood cuttings or where we don't have that particular air drip irrigation in that area. But by far over the years, we've really worked through these different things and we've worked hard on trying to be able to give the stock plants what we need to take very healthy and strong cuttings that we hope will root. In our grafting phase, all sign wood is collected uh, from our stock plants as our cuttings and production plants, depending which has the better wood. We start our grafting, con uh, grafting our conifers at the end of November and our work our way through till the end of February. Our first thing that we do is to prepare our understock in the previous photograph that you saw. We get all of our understocks prepared and they're brought into the building. Uh, then we begin our work. We have found in the past that uh, the first plant that we want to graft is all cedrus cultivars. Most, they must be done first and early before the heavy freeze and low temperatures come in. In the past, we would graft cedars in January or February, and we have issues with needle drop. This was due to desiccation of the cedar needles when the cedar needles, when the weather dropped below freezing, it stayed there. It's just one of the things that we had worked through. We typically um, do our cedars first in November. Then in February, we come back and we do our Pinus, Picea, Abies, Camus, Cypress, Junipers, Metasequoia, and Suga. And uh, you can see in these pictures here, grafting junipers. The reason that there is a, uh, a void in December, it's because our grafting team heads back home uh, December 1st, and they do not come back to February 1st. So we were able to, over a period of years, work that system out where we shut down all propagation, cuttings and grafting until our workers come back to 1st of uh, February. Our goal, though, is to have all this completed by the end of February. As you can see here, the different uh, modified side veneer grafts with these junipers that we do. <clears throat> And we typically, after we finish our grafting, we take them into the greenhouse and uh, we'll water them in. We do are cognizant of the amount of moisture that we have in the, in the root media, but we don't want them to go be plunged in until when it's too dry. We plunge all our grass into per, grafts into perlite with bed heat. We try to keep our ambient air temperature as cool as possible and keep our bed temperature at 65 degrees. Um, when we uh, plunge these plants, we try to uh, make sure they're at an angle uh, to have exposure to the sunlight. And uh, the, the method that we're using here uh, has worked very well with us for over the years. <clears throat> what we do is to, uh, when the new growth starts to break on the understock, we begin our cutbacks, taking only small amounts at a time. Times we leave the understock um, top on until we are ready to pot. This helps with securing the graft and cuts down on splitting of sign and understock. <clears throat> Since we are handling the grafts ourselves, we have found in the past that the understock that's left intact during the potting process really helps support the plant, and we feel it's imperative do not cause any kind of pressure on that graft union at that period of uh, potting. Uh, most of the uh, budding bands have started to deteriorate by that time. And so for they're not really helping any, giving us any extra support if there are some gra grafts that are still trying to knit. 
Over a period, we will then lift the graphs out of the perlite, let them harden off, and flatten them. Grafted conifers take more care and attention, and this result is a higher percentage of take. Do we have failure? Yes. We have found over the last 40 years, your success of numbers can be based more in the vigor and health of your stock plants and understock that the method and aftercare of your grafts. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk about container production of our grafted liners and cuttings for the field. Potting. We do not um, pot up our fresh cuttings and grafts until we finish our spring digging. All flats of cuttings and grafts are moved to a cool house in preparation for future bumping up. All cuttings are potted into four inch pots. They are then held in this pot to early fall when they will be bumped into a one gallon container. This is typically when the plants have flushed out heavy and the root system has filled in the four inch pots. And in this picture, you can see uh, these camia cypress that are in here. Uh, you can see they're in a, uh, a two gallon can. They are uh, two year rooted cuttings and uh, in preparation for that fall planting. <clears throat> All grafts are potted into a one gallon mesh pot in late spring or early summer, pending available time we bump up. <clears throat> Maintenance, at this time, uh, all plants that need staking will be staked and any trained, uh, any training completed. As you can see here is, is giving an example of bumping up the, the picture to the right with the two gentlemen. The, the gentleman on the left is holding a grafted plant that is in one of our one gallon mesh pots. And the gentleman to the right is holding the same cultivar as it's been potted up into a two gallon container. And then the pick on the left is uh, staking that plant as part of the maintenance. All plants are fertilized with slow release fertilizer and placed pot to pot for production. Bumping up, we typically bump up, like you see here from one gallon to two gallon containers. There may be some times where we may go to a larger container, a three gallon, but that typically would be for a deciduous plant. Our goal is to have all our plants from rooted cuttings or grass ready to bump up by mid fall. The plants will stay in these pots until they are ready for the field. As you can see in this photograph here, uh, there are graft, grafted material uh, that was bumped up uh, in the fall, and you can see the process of our staking. And those stakes will stay with those uh, conifer grafts all the way through bumping up, all the way through uh, planting out in the field, unless in the bumping up process, we need to go to a larger pot. Next is our planting out and preparation. And this is a really important thing for us, a very important phase for us to have um, our plants prepared for our fields prepared to receive our plants. Uh, typically, we would prepare the field after uh, a field that goes dormant. We would go in and prepare the field, put the cover crop in. And this is a, uh, these two pictures are showing you how do we maintain uh, soil where we've gone through and dug large blocks of plants. Uh, plans are made and mapped out well before we begin planting. Sometimes it may come down to the actual week or two before planting. Our planting farm and field location for our lining out process is based on rotation and time required for stock to finish in fields and be ready to harvest. We also, beside for preparing with our cover crops, we do soil testing every year, no matter what. And we do apply our applications of required lime and fertilizer based on our soil test. Over the years, we have changed the process of field preparation due to new innovative equipment for working fields. Basically, we start with uh, drilling the cover crop, which I talked about, but um, and mowing it down. And then we'll come in with our subsoiler and, and uh, our ripper, which this is a picture of our ripper and rip the ground. Uh, this, the uh, cover crop helps us build up organic matter in the soil and reduces the amount of runoff and erosion. 
uh, pending the previous uses of the field to be planted, we may do several soil preparation procedures. We do the subsoiling uh, to break up our compaction. Then we go in and, and you can see in this uh, picture, sorry for the delay, you can see in this picture uh, our, us ripping the soil with the, the uh, ripper and give you an idea of how we, how we do this. <clears throat> We do the subsoil, as I mentioned, break up the compaction. Then we go to our spading machine. It's a rotavator, which works the ground to the depth of about 24 inches. We have found over the uh, years using the machine cuts down on a series of other pieces of equipment that was needed to have the fields ready to plant out. Uh, the previous picture was us, us picking, uh, picking up debris out of the field and we've Typically find that when we have a lot of uh, deciduous trees and shrubs on a block, <clears throat> we'll have quite a few uh, root masses left over and it's really important to us to get those out uh, after we rip the ground. <clears throat> Excuse me. The spading machine, which I'd mentioned goes down to 24 inches, it's a German machine and it works in a, a reverse rotation action. And you can see the spades uh, in this picture right in the middle. Uh, that, that's a 10 foot wide piece of machinery and it takes almost a 200 power tractor, 200 horsepower tractor to operate it. And due to our topography of sloped and undulating ground, we take the time to use the proper equipment to get all of our fields to the current gradient slope we need. And you can see here in this picture how we cut down with plowing, disking, things like that, and we go from ripping the ground to uh, using this rotavator, a one pass through uh, to break the ground up. And the picture on the, on the right, you can see that yellow attachment. What that is, that's a leveler. Uh, we do, we have highly erodible soils, and we have found that when we prepare our grounds, we must make sure that any of the eroded areas are filled back in and leveled. And we, it's really important to us to not have um, an issue with runoff. Our soil to us is just as valuable as our plants. As far as laying out our fields, most typically, typically most uh, nurseries will uh, uh, start out with uh, one row and then use their planter guide to uh, work every row and adjacent to that. And with our ground and our topography, we have rolling hills. And we have found by following our, um, our machine uh, guide that just throws our rows all off. So what we do is we set up this transit type machine and we shoot, uh, we shoot our lines and our uh, contours with this. All of our fields are manually flagged for planting rows and spacing between the rows for digging and to maintain fields. And you can see here them laying it out and you can see in the distance of the yellow flags that they're setting out, they're completely spaced um, <clears throat> so that the person driving the planter is able to keep a bead right on the series of flags. The flags are approximately 100 to 150 feet apart and uh, though this is a lot of labor, it works, it saves time, and it creates efficiency in our rows that we install. Uh, and it's very important too that we have the right spacing between the, the uh, rows of plants where the short rows are, and then the larger spacings between the plants where the equipment goes, uh, that we don't run into an issue. It's wide at one end and narrow to the other. <clears throat> Pulling containers for planting out. This is an example of our finished material for the field. This is what we call field ready. This is the size that we like to go to the field with. And it's very important that all these containers are, when we pull them, they're all, they're all pulled in order by planting order. You can see this gentleman to the right is holding a clipboard, uh, Martine, and that has the list of plants in order how we're gonna plant them in the field. They're then loaded on the wagons pending the farm and field we are planting. <clears throat> the 
planting out, we use a single row planter for planting, which is fed plants as a machine works through the fields. And you can see here uh, the picture of all the wagons lined up. So each one of these wagons has a required number and variety of plants, and we know which fields they're going to. As I would mentioned for planting out, in the past we would fill up the, the planter racks with plants and with conifers especially, not like bare root, with conifers, the soil ball is heavy and we would uh, cause many problems, especially with planting cover crops or container plants. And just the sheer uh, weight and the fragility of the plants would cause great damage and not the way to start. And you can see in this picture, <clears throat> these plants have already been depotted. Uh, we shake the soil loose on them, try to break the roots up. It's really important to us that we do not have any type of root girdling as the plants mature. It works for us having the support wagon run right next to the planter, as you can see in this area. Sometimes the wagon will run right next to the planter, but in this particular case, it had to be a couple rows over. And it keeps transfer, uh, transferring plants over to the planter. Now, sometimes we'll have an assembly line of, of men between the wagon and the planter that'll just keep moving planters, and the, the planter never really starts, uh, stops, I mean. Uh, our spacing in the field, plant needs and growth rate and ability for efficient care and harvest, harvesting must be considered and what and where we plant. Over the years, Brad has developed a very amazing method and procedure for planting out. And you can see here, you can see the one gentleman holding uh, the uh, rod in his left hand. Believe it or not, it is worth the time to make sure that every plant is um, planted at the, at the exact spacing that we want, whether they're four feet apart, five feet apart, or six feet apart. We take the time to make sure that we've done that. He gets the planting crew started, letting them get ahead by several rows or short blocks. Then the other crews begin their part in the planting process. There come, this crew comes back behind the planter and just make sure that the plants are firm in the ground and that their spacing is properly, proper. <clears throat> as, as I mentioned, uh, we get ahead several rows, especially in our short blocks, and then other crews begin this part in planting process. At any given time, we will have in the same planting block the planter, the crew planting, the disc and crew using a narrow disc and a wide disc, disc in the rows. I don't have pictures of the disc, but these are the pictures. The previous picture in this picture is the picture of our cedar. We come right behind the planting crew, might be working in the same field, uh, planting and drilling grass seed into the ground. Behind that is the, that's the seed, uh, the crew drilling seed. In the irrigation, setting out drip irrigation is right behind them. Occasionally, we'll have to stop before we set out uh, the uh, irrigation uh, lines, drip tubes to pick up rocks because we do have rocks in our area. The next step will be the staking crew after the irrigation crew is finished. Here you can see the uh, irrigation, the rolls of uh, drip tube rolled up. Uh, and then here you can see them uh, putting it out in the field. One of the interesting things uh, is about our production is that we know exactly how many linear feet are per row per block. And when it's time to dig in the fall, the guys will go out and they'll use those uh, electric uh, reels and they'll wind up all those drip tubes and they'll, they are marked what their length is and what field they came from, and then they're stored until we are ready to plant again. And you can see in this picture, so they're, they are pulling from a reel of drip tube that has been stored that was destined for this field. And here you see a picture of, uh, of drip. One of the interesting things too, in the same day from planting to uh, 
disking to drilling seed to putting out drip to we have the ability to have water running on these plants uh, within hours of planting and it's really critical to us that we have irrigation on these plants as soon as we plant it. Here's another panoramic view of our uh, areas that have been that area has been planted, drill seed has been drilled, and drip tube has been put in and the drip system working. The next step would be a staking crew. And you can see the stakes where they have come back after we have planted. The, typically, we only lay the stakes in the field the day we plant or the next day, and we wait till the ground settles before we actually install the stakes. But I wanted to show you this picture, not just the plant staked, but you have the plants, plant staked, you have the drip irrigation, and you have the drilled grass seed that was all in one motion that day when we did this. And we typically get a green cover of grass at that period that you see there within 10 to 14 days. And it's very important to us that we have that due to our highly erodible soils. Unfortunately, 50% of our farmland is in grassways and 50% is in plants. And uh, if we had luxury, a really nice flat ground that we could work with, we could have more plants and, and less uh, uh, erosion control areas with these green areas. Next area I want to talk to you about is growing on. Typically, when you grow conifers, especially those conifers, sorry for the delay, I wanted to go back to this picture. This is our chemical uh, handling facility. It's a, a state of the art. They, we did it through the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, you can see the grate underneath of the spray rig that has uh, that's a uh, gutter that goes to a leachate tank and we're all run off from the uh, sprayer or any overflow goes into a leachate tank and then that is then dispersed of later on <clears throat> our spray program is very interesting because we um, though we're in a rural area we are in an area that uh, has a lot of traffic up and down the roads and we do have neighbors. And then one of the biggest reasons we changed our timing is because we're really into pollination and we grow a lot of uh, different uh, fruit crops that need uh, pollination from our honeybees. So we've changed our entire spray program. We now, all of our spray and all of our pesticides and fungicides are typically throughout the year uh, mostly during the warm season. Uh, we don't start spraying until about five or six in the evening, sometimes as late as eight in the evening, and we'll spray all night. All of our spraying is done at night. Uh, this is the day rig tractor. We have a night rig tractor with big lights that shine back on top of the sprayer and major lights to the left and the right and to the front so that the spray applicator can see where he is at all times but we found to be very successful successful with the, our spray program uh, happening in the evening. Our fertilization and, and other programs that we do, a granular is applied manually every year and in the spring. And we typically uh, side dress with our, with a, we used to side dress with a fertilizer machine, but we don't do that anymore. Um, but now, we uh, apply fertilizer by hand. And the, one of the reasons that we do this is that we find we get fertilizer actually right to the plant. You can see four guys uh, walking in a row fertilizing and they are applying by hand. And um, that way we just get the fertilizer where we need it. And believe it or not, it's cost you more in labor, but in the long run, it is much cheaper the way we do this. Irrigation, our irrigation is by drip and the water is supplied by several of our ponds and wells. We have over 300 acres that are drip irrigated. Deer control, our area, I don't know how it is everywhere else in the United States, but I gotta tell you, Maryland is inundated with deer. Uh, 
40, 50 years ago, you'd hardly see a deer. And now the herds of deer around here range anywhere from 30 to 50 in a herd and constantly all the time. For years, we battled deer pressure. Uh, we, we tried everything. I do remember one year we had planted out all these rare plants at one farm and we and it was so many different plants and, and such rarity that every plant had a laser labeled tag on the plant uh, when we planted in the fall and by the time March got here uh, went out into the blocks of plants and every label was gone the deer ate all the labels off of the trees and so uh, Bradley, who runs the, as I mentioned earlier, runs the production part of our uh, Fox Squirrel Nursery, he decided to take the two newest farms that he and his brother purchased. They're about 60 acres each. And he decided to spend the money to deer fence the entire farms. And he has decided to deer fence these farms because, though it's costly, the recoup of the cost in a, is in a very few years but the main reason is the cost savings is the, the less damage from the deer. He does have farms where he doesn't have deer fence and he has uh, hangs satchels of soap to try to deter the deer away from there. You can see in the big picture, you can see the deer fence on the left. That is a woven mesh wire deer fence. It's eight feet high. It's uh, a six inch round post and um, it is worth every cent that we spend when we did that. Harvesting. This is the final part of our, our, our growing process. Its inventory is kept up to date yearly, if not biannually, due to the vast varieties of conifers we grow. Planning out the harvest time of a field has many variables. The biggest is weather. We can irrigate, but we cannot control severe weather heat and frigid temperatures, always a challenge. Here you can see a picture of our wire baskets uh, that they're all color coded. And um, all plants are tagged in the late fall for, for orders going out the following spring. All orders are color coded per client. Now the, going back, talking about the colored baskets, that's a system that we have to make sure that the color basket matches the color burlap, matches the color required in the field. All conifers are tied up just before they are harvested. That's an important step so the plant's not stressed out. Um, typically, we'll go ahead and, and tie deciduous shrubs and trees up way ahead of time, a, a month at a time, but we found that we have issues with conifers if we tie them up too far in advance. So we really only tie them up right before we harvest them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Digging ball sizes are determined before digging begins, and it's listed on the dig sheet for the crew. And it can be variable what size ball we're digging depending on the plant. The digging process will vary depending on farm location, size of, size of ball needed, and customer ship date requests. Typically for production, our production, we prefer to block dig. This helps with efficiency by not jumping around the field from field to field. <clears throat> we prefer to go into a farm and to dig all the plants that are sold in that block and then move to the next block. And it can be a little bit tricky depending on how soon the, client, the customer wants their plants, but it is a challenge to, um, to make sure that we don't jump all around the field and lose time. Time is so important to us. <clears throat> Typically, the first of March, we'll start making sure all of our tagging is finished, all of our plants made it through the winter that are sold, and then they're all ready to tie up and, and start digging. We try to start digging by the first of March. We'll dig about two weeks, and then we'll start shipping about the second week of March. And it's all in a process. We have several different crews. We have the digging crew that actually does the digging and then sets the plants to the side. Then we have the tying up crew. And then we have the pulling crew, which you can see here with this tree boss, the pulling crew. Two crews are responsible for pulling plants out of the field, loading them on wagons and bringing them back to the loading. 
Their picking documents are based on shipping dates, client color codes, and farms we may be digging from at that time. Here you can see pulling two uh, fastidious forms of taxes out of the field. Wherever we can, we try to pull as many uh, plants, uh, haul as many plants as we can in one trip. One of the things that the digging, the pulling crew does do is they'll bring all the plants to the end of the rows and they'll group these plants together um, pending color codes. And so that all the color codes are all the same. So while all those plants are at the end of the row and then the wagons will come around to pick these plants up and then they're placed on the wagon. So this, these are uh, rows of wagons. We have 45 of these, I think, eight ton wagons. And they are all, you'll see a number on the wagon in the front there, and they're all numbered and we know what order they, what customer they go to. Um, shipping all the plants are staged in this loading dock where these plants are here. And we typically load about 10 tractor trailers and, um, and depending on our shipping documents. Uh, due to the fragile nature of some of our very unusual conifers, we may not stack the plants on the trailers when shipping. So we may not have the trailers. The our customers really appreciate how we take care of our products, especially the things that are very rare and unusual. And it's really <clears throat> important. If you're some of these unusual plants, you have to understand uh, it can take nine years before we harvest them. So we don't want to take nine years of our time and of this rare and unusual or different plant and go through the process of growing it, nurturing it, taking care of it, selling it, digging it, and then improperly packing it in a trailer, just trying to make a quota of plants that need to go on a trailer. We want to make sure that the end receiver, the homeowner that receives these plants has the plants that they need. What I want to do now is take you through a series of slides of our conifer, uh, different conifers that we grow. The following pictures of, of, are a few varieties of conifers that we have in production here at Foxborough Nursery. <clears throat> this is Calocedrus instant cedar. Uh, it's a great plant. It's uh, not many people grow it, but we love the plant. It does very well, and it seems to be a very popular plant for us. This is a dwarf form of Atlas cedar, Hortzman's dwarf. Uh, it's a wonderful plant, needs no attention at all. And it's just, in, especially in the spring when it breaks gro uh, growth with this wonderful powdery blue color to it. And you can see the cone set on the small picture on the left. And it is a very a full body plant, a slow growing, and it's just a, a wonderful form of the Atlantic cedar. This is a Garyu uh, cryptomeria. It's a dwarf cryptomeria. It grows very uh, blunt and compact. Um, we do grow a lot of the upright other forms, Yoshino, uh, those types. But we like to also grow some cryptomerias that do not get so large and so open. We want something fuller and, and tighter. And, and our clientele, we've introduced this to them. And they really favor this plant. And it's very Tough plant, very cold hardy, and very heat tolerant. Uh, Virginiana Taylor, this juniper is um, one of the new introductions from the Midwest. And Brad, uh, in one of the IPPS meetings, actually, it was when we had a combination meeting here at Foxboro, Eastern and Southern years ago. <clears throat> and the person that in, uh, introduced this Virginiana Taylor uh, talked Bradley into growing it. And he's been growing this plant, and it's just a wonderful, tight, uh, fastidious form of the uh, Virginiana juniper. Uh, Picea jesuensis hondensis. This is just a great bicolor spruce. Uh, it just has the two-tone color on it, similar to a Serbian, but a little bit more rigid. Uh, one of the nicest things about this is the new uh, cone buds. And you can see that beautiful purple color, which is really People really love this. Uh, Pisces morca pendula. This is one of my favorite weeping spruces. Uh, this is a true pendulous form. Stays very tight to the trunk, very cascading uh, shape and form. 
Uh, it's just a very wonderful looking plant. Uh, Orientalis, this is Pisces Orientalis nigra compacta. Uh, Pisces Orientalis in itself, the species Orientalis is just an incredible uh, variety or species of spruce. It's just a so many uses, so many wonderful features about this plant. It needs to be used more. This is a very tight, dark form called nigra compacta. This is a very different plant. This is a prostrate form of blue spruce called Dietz prostrate. We don't grow this very much anymore, but I wanted to show you this picture <clears throat> because I bought the stock plant from an auction back in the 80s. Uh, but it's just a very flat creeping form. We did used to grow a lot of different types of, um, of, of prostrate blue spruce, but it didn't lend itself to our, our digging program. They really any prostrate spruce needs to be grown in a um, in a container. This is a uh, a Austrian pine called Oregon Green, just a wonderful tufted dark green foliage, uh, white buds. Uh, just let it do its thing. It's just a beautiful plant. This is a Japanese white pine. This is Parviflora Yubuki Nishiki. Uh, just a wonderful. As instead of showing you the plant. Uh, I wanted to show you a close-up of the needles and the variegation and the, and the cones. It's just a tough plant, grows well in our area, does well in the landscape. We have two or three around the nursery here, around the office in my house, eight and ten inch caliper trunks, just a beautiful plant. This is a wonderful yellow form of a conifer. This is Piner Sylvester's gold coin, and it stays yellow all summer. Um, it does get more intense after the first heavy freeze. It's just a very slow growing form of the Scots pine, and it's just a great plant to uh, be able to have in the collection. Taxodium falling waters. Uh, I have to laugh when I see this picture because I remember at one of the IPPS auctions, it's the first time I saw that plant. It was in the auction fundraiser and I bought a three gallon plant and I don't remember how big it was. I guess it was about three to four feet and I paid three or $400 for it only to find out that spring a grower in North Carolina, I could buy the plant for $85. <laughs> but anyhow, this is a wonderful plant. It's created such an interesting characteristic in the landscape and uh, it's been a very favorite for ours. Taxus media robusta. We grow several tight vestigial forms of taxus. Uh, we have been very successful with them. There's a need for this type of plant in a non deer zone. A deer in Maryland tear up taxus, but this particular variety we do very well with. We have about five other vestigial forms. One of the things I look for in conifers, I look for things with uh, color. I look for not only what the summer growth color looks like, but what it's going to look like in the wintertime. And this is a prime example of a conifer, a Thuya orientalis sanderi. It has a very uh, glaucous color, very soft texture in the warm season. And as soon as the first major killing frost hits, it turns that beautiful plum color you can see on the left. Just a wonderful plant, gives you the different uh, colors and textures throughout the uh, year and that's what one of that's one of the wonderful things about conifers there there are all kinds of pines uh, the different species of pines uh, st uh, strobus uh, nigra sylvestris densiflora resinosa uh, virginiana that will change colors after the first frost hits and and there are same with camia cypress and thuya forms there are forms that will change color after the first frost hits and I think that's one of the most interesting things about conifers. It's so in ending my talk, I just wanted to give you a, a picture of, of what these conifers that we grow look like in the landscape and uh, why we are attracted, why I was attracted to them as a young boy. And I wanted to be able to grow these as a profession with the help of my son who got me in line to be more commercially minded. And as time grows on and these plants get larger and mature, you can see how they all pull together in the landscape. And this is just not a feature that is one 
season of the year, with the exception of the red cutleaf maple, you can imagine those conifers and those different colors of blue and green and yellow uh, have that color year round. So you have really impacted the landscape. In closing, the world of conifers has such a needed place in our landscape and gardens. And what genre of plants can you find that create beauty anytime and in any day of the year? I wanted to end with this slide. I make a lot of wreaths and I wanted to show you this wreath that I made years ago. And you can see all the different conifers that are in that wreath and what a difference that it makes. And that's why here at Foxboro, conifers are a major part of our production. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for uh, being a part of this virtual talk. And at this time, I'll be glad to take any, any answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dave, so much for your, your slideshow there and showing us around you in your three. Hi, everybody. It's really beautiful. Well, I, first, I'd like to, before we get to question and answering, um, I would like to thank everybody for participating. But most of all, I, this whole uh, slide presentation you have seen is the result of a young man, my oldest son, bringing out in the field when he was about five years old, working by my side. And when he gets out of college, he wanted the opportunity to do something. And what you saw today is the result of a 38 year old young man that has got us to where we are. So I'm ready for some questions. Awesome, we got a lot of questions for you, Dave. Um, let's just jump right in here from Ryan Blake. He asks, what are your thoughts on grafting sealant for junipers? Have you used it in your production? What, what was the question again? Grafting sealant, have you ever used it? Oh, seal it, no, no. Um, if, if you, you we use uh, a sealant, we'll use a, a, a honeybee wax and some paraffin wax mix to do our deciduous plants. Um, but in conifers, we I, I did that oh about, about 40 years ago. I had damage to the plants. That's why we plunge all of our conifers are plunged in perlite, straight perlite. We get some air circulation. We maintain moisture. And, uh, and, it, and it, it really helps the plant to, the whole idea is to get the quickest and the fastest uh, healing of the wound that the graft takes. Okay, great. Uh, I have two more questions from Brian. He came in first here, so I'll start with those. On one of the juniper pictures, an employee was watering what I think was a freshly grafted juniper. Are you worried about getting the graft union wet before it has callus together? Well, the, the bottom heat is 65 degrees and uh, those understocks, the we don't, years ago, we used to bring them in and heat them up and get root activating. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We bring them right out of a cold house and typically our cold houses are kept really dry. And so what we try to do is, is get a percent of moisture into that root media, into that container before it's plunged. Uh, and our media is so friable uh, that uh, it drains out very well and we have no issues at all with uh, any type of root rot or any type of moisture holding on too long. And you got to remember too in grafting, uh, we just don't plunge those grafts and walk away from them and come back in the spring. Those grafts get checked a couple times a week. So they're, they're like our nursery or babies. We're checking them and if we need to water them, we'll add water. If we need to not water them, we won't. Okay. Um, let's see here. Have you ever used peat moss instead of perlite to cover the freshly grafted junipers? And we used to use uh, peat moss just on a uh, hemlock suga. We tried, uh, earlier we tried perlite on suga and we didn't think it worked that well. And then uh, we went to peat moss um, but here in the past uh, 10, 15 years, we switched back to perlite. Uh, we try to keep the hemlock grafts uh, against a wall where we have higher humidity. And, um, 
and higher moisture content. And so the perlite at this point works better for us. Okay, cool. Um, Michael Cook asks, what do you use for the soil in your pot? This, it's, a, it's a pine bark media that has some, uh, some peat and other additives to it. It's already, uh, it's already a media pre-mixed buy it from a company down south and it comes in here and it's, it's dumped in a bin. And uh, if we uh, are potting a particular group of plants that might require a, a higher pH, we may add some lime, uh, but it's basically a uh, soilless media, pine bark. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch over. I had a question from Patrick Peterson. He asked, the fields look very clean and free of weeds. Can you share a little about what herbicides you use? Well, we, we used to use a lot of pre-emergent herbicides, uh, but because of our uh, Chesapeake Bay issue, uh, we do a incredible amount of pan uh, spray and of Roundup. You saw the one uh, slide of the gentleman with the buckets of fertilizer. Well, I should have showed you the slides of the gentleman with backpacks of Roundup. And you saw that one, I didn't talk about that one small John Deere uh, tractor, the small one that had a, a boom cover to the one side. And that's uh, a Roundup herbicide applicator. Okay, effective but time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shelby asked, this is kind of on the same line there, are there secondary problems or unforeseen issues with spraying at night that you had to overcome? No, well, yes, the police. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, had the, we had the sheriff's department called on us at 2.30 one night. Um, no, you know, we, we try to um, we're, we're in a zone here in Upper Harford County where there are a lot of uh, honeybee operators with beehives. And since we ha also grow some winter berries and we like and for pollination, um, we just found over the years that spraying in the evening and, and at night just works really better for us. And has there, have there been any negative results to this? No. No negative results. It's just um, just it's takes more um, takes a lot more energy and uh, efficiency to be able to do that type of application at nighttime. And we have when we did spray during the day, even with the before, I remember before we bought tractors that had cabs with charcoal charcoal filters on them. Our, our spray guys would have the, the, the moon set, the moon helmet with air pack and all the spray gear and the gloves driving down the road with a sprayer behind them. And then our phone would be ringing off the hook and then the health department would call, you know. So nighttime is for us. Um, Gail Berner is asking, Dave, your nursery is just gorgeous, true story. Question you. on your experience rooting upright junipers. Any success with rooting or do you graft them all? Well, um, we graft all of our upright forms of junipers uh, because yes, they can be rooted, but sometimes we have found the uh, at the root primordia, uh, at the wound on the cutting, sometimes we'd find a mass of roots that would come out one side of the cutting and as and we we even though we bare root it out of the flats and we trim it and we pot it up we still growing on years later we'd have more of a stronger root mass to one side of the of the juniper than all the way around and for us it's more efficient it's 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 easier and it is a time saver we get faster return by grafting um, Joe Meany, interested in hearing if you've ever tried spruce from cuttings and if you've had success with any particular method for fertilizing containerized conifers, do you prefer a particular slow release ratio and how much do you use in your one and two gallon containers? Those are pretty specific. <laughs> well, I can't answer him on the fertilizer. That's that's Brad's. I don't know what the uh, the amount they apply, 
I will tell you it's it's variable with the uh, the the genus of conifer that we're potting up. Uh, one thing uh, that we do with those conifers, the the soil media is like I mentioned earlier, is a pine bark media. Media. Uh, years ago, we used to do all start them all out in Zarn 300s or Zarn 400s. With the 400 is a true one gallon, 300 is the cheat one gallon. Uh, we didn't feel like we got our, our conifers root out as fast in those pots. And uh, we are having trouble with some root rot. So we switched uh, to that mesh pot. Uh, it's, a, it's a very rigid mesh pot, a lot of air, growing conifers, especially unusual conifers at that stage. You, knew, you need a lot of drainage, you need a lot of air there to, to grow on. Okay, um, Tanya is asking, do you have issues with rabbits biting into your drip lines or any other vermin? We don't, we don't have trouble with, no, we don't have troubles at all with rabbits on the um, drip line because the drip line is pretty thick and we don't have emitter tubes coming off of the drip line. Where we have trouble with uh, rabbits and field mice, if we get a lot of snow, uh, we will we'll have issues of girdling at the snow line. And, and in the greenhouses and all those are the pictures of those greenhouses that are covered in white poly, uh, we have to put out rat bait in those greenhouses. It's just a, a major requirement every fall we, we put out the bait, we put do a very rigid flat upside down that has a hole cut out like a mouse door and with a concrete block on it uh, because of field mice. We've had field mice come in and uh, get into the greenhouses. And one year we had them girdle over 500 uh, Cameocyphras up to Sananda gracilis. And even in the fields, I don't know if you know people. You people noticed in the fields are really mowed really tight. That's we do that too. We just our guys just left Sunday to go home for the Christmas. Last week we mowed all the fields as low as we could because we're trying to control the field mouse population. Sure. Yeah, it's a constant battle. Um, let's see here. We have a question from Gary Coleman. What is the grass cover crop that you use? I am curious if mixtures that include nitrogen fixing species like legumes are feasible and would assist in fertility management. Well, the, the, uh, the, the grass ways are all, all a K31 type. And uh, the cover crop is a Sudan. Um, Gary Coleman also asks, growth of both conifers and deciduous tree species is impacted by the soil microbiome, and in particular mycorrhiza, which can impact nutrient stress and disease relations. Is there any consideration of this in your production system? Is there any consideration in my production system? Correct. Well, well we do soil tests every year and um, we analyze our soil and, and we try to uh, create a, a, a health soil, a healthy as soil as possible. We have not used any mycorrhizae in the field as such. We try to do that with our organic matter from our Sudan and, um, and we base our fertilizer on that. Um, we have to be careful with our soils here because as I mentioned in the talk, we are a very, have very highly erodible soils. And so our grass system, that's why our, you guess all the gentlemen for, uh, fertilizing the tree, the nursery rows, we don't fertilize the grass strips. They get no fertilizer. We try to keep it right in the rows itself and keep all the nutrients there at that point. Have we done tissue samples? Yes. Have we seen a point where we needed to add um, some type of elements to the soil? Well, yes, when needed. That depends on the test. Uh, what we do is we try to monitor the health and the vigor of our plants throughout the entire growing season, not the dormant season, the growing season. Uh, but 
uh, with growing any plants, it's, it's really interesting. The conifers, we have one farm, it's just solid rock and the conifers grow like a weed in that solid rock. You plant the conifers in a really highly organic soil situation in the field and they don't grow, they grow half, as, half the rate they would in a really rocky soil. So, and we have a lot of limestone here. We have a lot of soapstone and a lot of nutrients uh, in the soil with the soapstone. Thank you. Um, you answered some of this already from Tanya. Again, it says, why do you put the grafted liners in the bed of perlite? Um, do you reuse the perlite? Well, we, we plunge the grafts in perlite to keep the union moist and warm. And no, we do not reuse the perlite. We, the perlite goes to our organic pile and gets mixed back in. Sure. Um, David is asking, what herbicides do you use? And I don't know if you can answer that. No, I can't. I threw that a little bit. Okay, perfect. Um, Shelby is asking, I may have missed this. How do you track inventory? How do you keep track of your propagation data? Shelby's always asking about the data. <laughs> well, Every, everything is, everything in our operation, Bradley is, is, is very, very good at tracking everything he does from the cuttings, the, not just the quantity of cuttings, where they come from, what hormone, everything. Everything is written down and, and brought into Mariana and Mariana enters all of this information. This all is entered into, what's our database? UDS data, database. So everything we're tracking the plant from a cut to when the plant is loaded on a tractor trailer. And inventory, we do inventory twice a year, right? We do inventory twice a year. Um, okay. Raul is asking, when taking cuttings, is it very important to choose the right type of tissue, tender, semi-ripe, ripe, et cetera, or not so much? Well, if you're, do if you're doing conifers, conifers, you tip uh, in our setup, we typically do them as a hardwood cutting. So we typically don't do a hardwood cutting until after we've had a several frost and, and that the plants have started to go into dormancy. So therefore the wood would be harder. You can do conifers as a softwood cutting uh, in July. You can't do them much earlier than that because the wood hasn't hardened off. The softwood hasn't hardened off enough to do it in July. But we found with conifers, you get a higher percentage doing conifers when they're dormant as a hardwood cutting. Okay, thank you. Um, Donna is asking, she says, great presentation. Are you? Are your propagation houses covered with double, double layer plastic? How to oh. maintain a cool ambient air, air temperature with bottom heat? Uh, all of our propagation houses are double inflated. They're double inflated until we get a snowstorm, then we deflate them. Uh, and they all, all the cutting house and the grafting house, the cutting house is hotter than the grafting house. The grafting house, we keep the bed heat around 65 degrees. We try to keep the ambient air temperature at 50 or below 40 degrees. We want the understock and the cyan to be cold. We want the root, the uh, healing to come from the heat on the root zone for the grafts. And the cutting house, we're still trying to create some type of humidity, some type of moist uh, heat in the house so it is hotter. And um, so same thing with the bed temperature on that, but the heat's a little higher in the cutting house. Okay. Uh, I have a question from Mike Gates right here in Wisconsin. Hey, do you cover or tent your grafts? Do you spray your grafts? If so, how often? What are you treating for? If, if we have to, uh, well, no, if, if we, as far as tenting goes, yes, we used to tent the grafts years ago and we had more issues of, try, of, uh, of a heat buildup, controlling heat buildup. Build up. So we just did away with the tents and having uh, just having air circulation. We found that's much better for the 
scion and, and, and for the understock, especially when these plants get to a point of breaking bud in the spring. Uh, do we spray? Uh, yes, we would spray when the plants are uh, that are starting to heal and they're starting to uh, um, uh, and we're starting to heal and we're starting to um, um, I lost track of what I was saying. Oh, it, it, we, we want to make sure that we don't get a fungus build up in the new growth. Okay. Um, this is a very specific question from Evan. Any plans on propagating Suga Traveler? Uh, which one? Uh, Suga Traveler. Uh, it's, it's not in our um, plans right now, but you never know. You know, we, Bradley uh, brings in new selections every year into this nursery. We evaluate them and we look at them and see whether we want to put them in production. We have so many varieties of conifers here that aren't in production because they just don't work into the commercial production system. Sure, you can't keep them all just because you no. like them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, do you use any biochar? No. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions here and then we'll wrap it up. Donna says, great presentation. Are your propagation houses? Oh, we already did that one. Let's go on. Gary Coleman, last question. This is not really a question about nursery production, but as a tree biologist that works in the area of tree monoculture genetics physiology, scientific advances now make, may make it feasible to use gene editing methods to alter foliage, coloration, growth habit, et cetera. How do you think this would be accepted by the industry? Well, the industry is, has, I feel, has always been open-minded, especially our organization, IPPS. And anything, any, research, old or new or, or in the future, any research that we need to look at that can help us, uh, not just in production, but help us with the health of the plants that we are growing. Our biggest battle as growers in agriculture, not just nursery, but agronomic crop, uh, crops, and any of you that horticulturists real, uh, realize that this climate change is affecting everything. It's affecting how plants grow, how plants respond to what you do for them, it, everything. And so any looking into genetics, are genetics changing? Are genetics changing because of the weather climate change? We need to stay ahead of this. And yes, we all need to be, I would think the industry would be open hands to this. I agree. Well said. That is it for the questions today. Thank you so much, Dave, for doing this for us. And well, Mariana, for for Mariana, that I know helped you and your sons, who I'm sure have had a hand in this, as you yeah. said. Um, once again, Stephanie posted on the chat that we do have another meeting on the 17th. And then again, Brian will be on, on January 21st. I personally want to thank everybody for joining us in these micro meetings. I've really enjoyed hosting them. This will be my last one. So I will pass the baton on to some other lucky individual in our group. Liz, um, as always, you do a fantastic job. Thank you, Dave. That means a lot. And everybody have a great uh, couple of weeks. And um, if you don't make it to the next one, a great holiday, but please do join us on December 17th with Brian Decker. He'll be talking to the students and talking about the foundation. And um, once again, thanks everybody. And thank you, Dave. Okay, thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.